So let's try to take the survey to intermediate drug discovery. Uh, drug discovery and design. Um, I, I, I will give you uh, an overview of conditional simulation, how conditional simulation can help in general to solve some problems, and in particular drug discovery. I know that we, we heard a lot of how the simulation uh, or the um, but it, it, it's interesting to review that concept again. Um, so the presentation will try to stay at a very uh, conceptual level, very few equations, um, because the important thing is you just need to know and to fix the, the concepts, and then you go Sooner or later, we'll learn. But the concepts, that's, that's the, the, the real problem. Uh, people who do simulations, probably not all of you do simulations, computational simulations, but people who do simulations, the risk there is to become runners, runners of programs. Um, so the second is how can bilateral simulation aid drug discovery? Um, so stress which are the approximations that are involved? Um, and the, the range of validity. So why do I use what I use? And then we'll give a sense of what cannot be done. Some, some of you come from the biological slash biochemical world. And the biological world, unfortunately, is quite polarized. There are people who believe that nothing can be done with computers because they are completely skeptical. And there are some people who believe that anything can be done with computers. So they treat us who do simulation sort of a service unit. So, can you do this? Um, no, this cannot be done. So, this is that even if it's possible, that can be done, that can be done fast, and that we have to do it. So, um, computational simulation can do many things that aid in many problems, but it's not the solution to every problem. So this is a very, very, very broad uh, representation. So in the real world, you have experiments. You do experiments with the experimental data that assume that that data is reliable, and you draw some conclusions from with the real world problem. You can do the model is sort of an abstraction to a different degree. And you apply some computational methods. So the first thing that you have to do when you use or develop computational methods is you have to check how well your computational predictions match the real world experiments. If your computational methods are successful, then you can use your computational methods to predict unknown properties all properties under different, well, under different conditions, for example. Uh, le le let's give you an example. Uh, computational simulation can be aided in the prediction of properties which are difficult to determine experimentally. So, for example, modeling transmembrane, uh, transmembrane proteins such as GPCR, but they can be crystallized. Tedious and uh, slow process. Or you can study protein dynamics. Protein dynamics cannot, in general, cannot be determined just with experiments. 
anyone can provide some insight into protein dynamics. But a computational simulation, if it's properly done, can give you the evolution in time of the system. Computational simulations are flexible to change the conditions of the system. So suppose, I don't know, that you're performing an experiment, whatever, at what at what your pressure. Well, an experiment takes six months. Now you want to study how the system reacts at two at the beginning. Okay, it's a new, a new experiment, a new setup. So, for example, in drug discovery, you can study the protein with a non-native data. Suppose that you crystallize one GPCR, which is very laborious, with one ligand. And now you want to see how that protein interacts with another ligand. Well, you have to so crystallize the protein again, uh, give the crystals, solve the structure. So it is very really flexible for this. Then it could be fast and could be cheap. But it's cheap compared to experiments. And um, it could be quite fast. So it can be used in computer aided drug discovery. At, at a certain at a, at a, even stage in the long process of drug discovery. I'll show you later on when uh, it's useful. And, well, computational simulation can bring some understanding of the microscopic behavior. Sorry, sorry the microscopic behavior in terms of the microscopic one. Well, a lot of dynamics is the case. You have a protein, you put water, you press a button, you run the simulation. You, after a long simulation, you could get the thermodynamics of the, of the system. Or, perhaps, for example, you can try a quantum mechanical description of the bimolecular system. It's something that we, are, we have been doing since about four or five years. So, treating the whole system, the complete uh, protein in quantum mechanical in a quantum mechanical way, uh, and always bear in mind that uh, simulations are a complement to experiments, not a substitute. Well, again, this, this is a general, but I want to review this before going into discovery. Suppose that you have a system. And you want to study the system. So, at the conceptual level, what you construct the steps that you take. Well, if, if you're going to work with a protein and you're going to do structural based on discovery, for example, you need a structure. That's a good thing. It can be a X-ray, an MR, it could be a harmonic quadratic model. So what you need, in fact, is the identity and the positions of the atoms. Okay, so uh, for protein, you need well. Here I have an alanine. These atoms, uh, these atoms are this point of space. Uh, each atom has the uh, coordinates, x, y, z coordinates. Eventually, the connectivity. So how atoms are connected in proteins. That's not needed. If you say that you have an alanine, well, you know how the atoms of an alanine are connected. In reality, the atoms are connected the same way. If you have a ligand, that's a different story. You have to say if the, the, the bond between the two carbons is a single double of triple, for example. Once you have that, you have to choose how you are going to represent that system. A system can be represented in different ways. Can be, for example, represented by nuclei and electrons, and that's quantum mechanics. So you're going to solve the triangular equation. You can say, well, I know I'm going to represent the system uh, as uh, atoms. So here we are going to use a ball, certain parameters. Uh, you can uh, use related atoms, for example. 
CH3 to the carbon, the carbon which is hydrogen, becomes one part. Or you could do coarse grain, so you represent many particles with one big of particles. Or, for example, potential energy mass. So you represent protein with a mass, potential energy mass. Once you have that and connect it to item two, you have to determine the level of theory. If you're going to do quantum mechanics, well, it's different if you do uh, density functional theory, ab initio, semi empirical. If you're going to do modern mechanics, so for example, if you chose the all atom representation, well, you have to specify the force field. So, which force field are you going to use? The tense force field. And after you fit, I mean, you choose this, what you get is the potential energy function, which is a function of the coordinates of the atoms, or in uh, quantum mechanics, the coordinates of the nuclei and the atoms. Once you have this, you're almost done, you have to choose an algorithm to explore the potential energy surface. So the system gets an energy surface that depends on the coordinates of the atoms. And you think you, what you do in every problem is to explore that. In whatever dynamics, you explore the, body, the potential energy surface. In a way, in Monte Carlo, you, exp you explore it in a different way, but that's basically what you do. So the molecular representation, well, you have the quantum mechanical representation that I think that Ernesto um, uh, show the, the Schrodinger equation, we are not going to go into this. And you have the classical mechanics representation in which each atom is represented by a sphere with the mass, the charge, and the radius. And the energy of the system is calculated in terms of these properties and atomic parameters and the distance, the progress distance between uh, particles. So this is a very general, very general uh, equation for the potential energy of a force field. There might be times missing. There are some force fields that have, for example, an extra hydrogen bond term, like ECTP, the force field that, for example, um, Corbin-Mula uses and that we use. Uh, so this is the Van der Waals term. It takes into account the dispersion interaction and the point of us repulsion. So if, if you approach, if two atoms approach and approach at some point, they start repelling each other. That doesn't consider. It, it's, it's not an, it, it's not an electrostatic effect, it's a quantum effect. Uh, this is the electrostatic term, and this is the uh, bond stretching. Uh, Planar angle term and torsional term. Always bear in mind that once basically you you chose that, you to choose that you have to take into account this. So which, which is the approach of what the approach depends on three things. Which is first of all which is the property of interest. Are you going to calculate things of shifts? Or are you going to calculate binding the energy? Or you are just going to calculate uh, the modes of the ligand within the binding side? Then you have to determine which is the required accuracy. That's also something important. So suppose that you, you want to determine how the ligand binds within and binding side. So you're trying to determine the pose. And you have a protein, let's say that you have a crystal structure at this uh, solid at two Armstrong solution. Well, your the pose of your ligand, so the coordinates of the atoms of your ligand will have you, you you need them at one decimal point. So two point two Armstrong. You don't need six decimal pieces for that. The atoms of the protein already have an error, which is the first decimal piece. 
So you, you, you have to, to specify that. Uh, and then the computational power. So you, you, you may have a duty to power. Uh, for which you need very high accuracy. <coughs> but with your computational power, means that it will take you to failure. You have to try either you apply for more computing time or you change your project. So let, let's go more in depth in computer aided drug discovery. So that's a very, very event representation of the drug discovery process. Let's start with the target discovery. So somebody has to tell you this target is important, is relevant. We assume that that person validated already that assessment. So he did a lot of experiments. And well, they have to be as a group. Prodis kinase A is relevant in this type of process. So I believe that if we block ATP binding to this protein kinase A, that that will have an impact in the uh, proliferation of cancer cells. So, well, what you just need is to find a molecule that binds to protein kinase A, but doesn't bind to other proteins, or if it binds, doesn't have any side effect that uh, have a good pharmacological and pharmacodynamic profile, and uh, well, and, and many things that are easy to enumerate but are very difficult to get. So at some point in the past, what pharma uh, companies did is well, they tried to they tried it from comp uh, compounds, and what they had had a deal, they began optimizing the deal. Uh, before proteins, industrial protein proteins were available, that optimization was basically weak on the compound. Okay. It was a ligand based optimization. It was nothing that's new over all kinds of fully intuitive um, with when when um when the strategy became available, well now if you could model the ligand within the binding site, you could use that to guide your optimization. So they still continue using what was, uh, I mean, the screening of compounds. But now, well, they began more and more to use, uh, to take into account the interaction between the ligand and the protein at the structural level. <clears throat> so the, once you, you have your target, what you need is to screen a chemical library. And after that, when you get some kits, you see that the molecule finds the target uh, at 100 nanomoles. Well, it's an interesting thing. Now I'm going to optimize it. And you're here. Suppose that you optimize it, and you get a beautiful molecule that finds at 1 nanomoles. Um, it seems to have a good pharmacological profile. And that's excellent. But you have to test it. So you start your clinical animal studies, then you go to clinical trials, and after 10 years and one hundred million dollars, you get the drug on the market. So as you see, this is a quite long process, it's very expensive, and it can fail at any point. So um, it can fail here. In phase three, which is the last stage. So, when a company gets a failure at phase three, imagine that probably they had spent $800, $900, $600 dollars a year. So, that's, that's a problem. Uh, and in fact, in the last 10 or 20 years, I mean, most, most of the failures 
So, in this stage where you screen molecules looking for things and you optimize them, well, here you can use computers to make the process faster, cheaper, and more rational. More rational means that uh, you basically avoid doing blind tests. If you try to um, guide your search in a rational way. So let me first explain to you the concept of blocking. Computer aided reference coding is a very wide uh, area. There is some area which we can use for discovery for try to get new hits from existing liquids when you try to uh, optimize data for better liquids just based on existing liquids. I'm not going to go into that. I, I will try, I will focus on um, structure-based rapid discovery and especially in um, docking-based because you can do other structure-based methods like quantum of course you do screening. But basically this is perhaps the most representative. And if you understand this, it's not difficult to know in others. So the, the, the concept of talking is in talking you predict the orientation and conformation of the molecule between the binary sites. So you have a 3D right here, you have a 3D representation of the protein, what you have here as a mesh is represented by the design. This is certainly a nuclear receptor. I think that these proteins are inside. They get you them. But um, so when you talk the molecule, what you get is the molecule talk. The molecule is the by inside. Which is here represented as spheres. And as a speaker. So that's basically the end of it. Regardless of how you do it. <coughs> um, after you, you, you talk it, well, you, you would like to assess the binding reality. The binding reality is different. You could have a method to accurately predict the binding reality of every one of the compounds. At, at chemical, uh, chemical um, accuracy, you will need experiments. At least if you turn by a uh, Of course, what you can do here, especially if you, as you will see, if you do hydrogen docking, is, well, it, it's quite limited, but at least it's a goal. So, the, the docking, in fact, what is, is an in silico binding experiment. So you are trying to reproduce the binding experiment in your computer. Here, so stop me if you have any more questions. No? So, <coughs> suppose that you have a target. That you know that protein X is a target, and you have the structure. So, suppose also that you have a chemical library. If that library, if you have it, the physical chemical library, what you can do is what's called high-throughput screening. So you screen in a very fast way all of these compounds, and you get some hits for these. Of course, it's not error-free. You're not doing a binding experiment. It's not that I do the biochemical asset. So you, you get some hits. Some, uh, with some false uh, positive, but you can do something else. You can do well. If I have the the, the, the the structure, I can try that docking that we we've seen here, but in a high throughput way. I can do it for all the libraries. Not 
way. So I can do this process and then just test the top scoring compound. Every time you do the top, it work. You get an estimation of the quantum piano. If that's not fully accurate but acceptable, I can run the molecules by the estimation of the binding free energy and just test the top scoring compound. When I say top scoring, well, subject, it's not just that score that binding free energy. There are many things to also visual inspect, meaning of the data, which is quite handy. But if you do that and test, well, that selection, the selection of compounds which are going, which are actually being uh, tested, is a rational selection. Just, you, 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 you don't just use brute force, test everything. Just test selected compounds. 10, 20, 50, 50. Depends on your budget. Uh, this, well, this review is a specific review that we wrote well, already four years ago about high throughput screening and high throughput uh, dog. It's a of the two uh, methods. Yeah, we have done performances. So let, let's go back to this high throughput dog and let's represent it in a matricial way. So, suppose that you have the, the receptor and you have a library of n compounds. So, at the docking stage, what you do is you dock each of these compounds within the binding site. So that's the rows of these things. So you dock compound A, you get complex A. You dock compound B, you get complex A. And you do that for every compound. Once you have that, what you do now is you score the compound. That's the last row. This is the scoring and ranking. So now you score each compound in principle by binding to the end. If you could do that in an accurate way, that's fine now. That will give you the binding free energy of each compound, but of course you select the, one with, or the ones with best binding free energy. Life is not so easy in a way, so you get a score. But you rank these complexes by score, what, and what you are doing is you are ranking your compounds by score. The ones with best, better score are more likely to bind the target. So those are the ones that you are going to select, or by equation. In fact, the score, well, th there are different ways to calculate the score. One is the plane binding the equation that is on error three and has, uh, is not fully accurate. In many cases, we use an, an empirical score, which is a function uh, which is expressed as the sum of different com contributions. So it's a function that has some uh, contribution for ionic interactions, aromatic interactions, metals, hydrogen bond, whatever. There is no uh, unique or hundreds, uh, hundreds of scoring points. The reason that you do this and you don't use very uh, rigorous Binding reality evaluation is because of time. To do a very powerful uh, calculation of binding reality for a given molecule takes a lot of time. But you are trying to use a high throughput uh, protocol. So it means screening half a million, a million, two million compounds. So you cannot spend one day per compound to determine the binding reality. So you use, so you compromise your accuracy as the trade of speed. So let's uh, have you today. So we have a target, we have a library, we don't have people talking, each molecule gets a score. So, well, what do you get? So here, 
here, for example, is a way to represent what you get. This is a hydrobotocking of the so here, the, the, the molecules that you have on the x axis is form, uh, and on the y axis, the mass. It's just the mass to separate the dots. This is the way to, to classify them. So the score, the uh, more negative, the better. Uh, this score, well, the units are, are units of the energy, but the range is not the range of the energy. So a molecule doesn't have minus 55 uh, take out from all as uh, G. Uh, it's just that, well, this critical score sometimes, I mean, uh, I mean the, it, it doesn't correlate to the finding. What you're trying to do in this kind of talking is to not to predict the fine reality of each compound. What you're trying to do is to separate your library into groups. The top, the best group, which, is the, which has the compounds which are more likely to bind than the rest. That, that's the goal of high level talking. It's not a prediction of finding reality for each compound. So here, for example, you have uh, well, the tree balloon, that is a known value of AR, which has a very good score. You have a testosterone that is also a very good binder, uh, also has a very good score. And well, for example, here you have a binder, which is far to the right. So if you do this, and in a predictive way, what you would do is you say, well, I cut I mean, I take these 868 compounds to the left, and I analyze those. If you could have done that, you could have picked, like, the metric alone at the hydrotestosterone in a blind and predictive test. So, let's try to go more into that. Uh, structural basis or kind of the topic. So, what are the elements? What would say input? Well, you need a structure for the receptor. You don't have that, you don't have a problem. I mean, the septic problem, you have a problem. And uh, you have to represent the receptor somehow. Full atom, potential, uh, energy mass, to agree, somehow. Once you define that, you need a chemical library. So you're going to do high proof. You're going to do big data. These SDF mod 2 are different formats of a chemical library. So a chemical library should contain information about every compound. So every molecule should be represented somehow. For example, you have to specify for it. Every molecule, the atoms, the identity of the atoms, the connectivity, and even with the position. You could build the position. So if you know that, well, the molecule has atoms in the way, you can start placing the atoms in, in space and then you optimize that. <laughs> so you need a 3D representation of the compounds also. Once you have that, what you do is a, a docking of every compound. So every compound gets a docking energy, which is slightly different than the core. The docking energy tries to determine which is the best conformation the scoring scores different ligands. <coughs> so you keep the best or the best two or three poses of each ligand, and then you take the best pose or best poses, and then you score. You calculate the score. Sometimes the score 
that the docking energy are the same. But usually the score is faster as the terms. Because you're just trying to <coughs> determine the best confirmation for a single link. Or the best confirmation, the best process for a single link. So again, docking energy discriminates confirmations of the same link. Docking scores discriminate different among different ligands. So what are the advantages and limitations of hybrid docking? Well, first it provides rational approach. You at least, in theory, you have a, you have a uh, sound theoretical foundation to prefer one ligand to the other to be tested. The goal is to enrich the abilities with potential binder. The goal of hydrocodoxy is not to discover every possible binder in the data. That's not the goal. On the other side, sometimes you do a hydrogen docking and you might select two compounds which are all inactive. What happened? Well, many things could have happened. One thing that could have happened is that there were no binders in the data. So if there are no binders in the database, the program will discover in the binder, but there are none. If there are binders and they didn't show up, well, your protocol could be wrong, uh, you are giving a lot of uh, false negatives, whatever. What are the advantages? Well, speed is quite fast compared to by chemical violation, so that is what would be doing ICP for one million compounds, or, or even just one point okay. testing a compound for the testing compound for five years, and that's one for only one million compounds. There's low cost. I mean, once you have a similar thing, you have a software. That's it. Um, it provides a tentative bound structure. This is important. So at some point, when you select the molecule and you test it and it's positive, uh, you have from the docking the bound structure. Well, in principle, tentative uh, bound structure, but you, you have also that. And it's less biased towards existing chemotypes. This is different from ligand based. In ligand based, you have a ligand, and you try to find ligands similar to this one, which are also fine. Most likely, you will find some ligands. But the problem is that those ligands are very similar to the original ligands. In this case, the chemotypes might discover are more diverse. Limitations of high group of docking, huh? doing docking in high group way. The binding energy prediction is usually poor. Again, you are not trying to predict the binding energy, you are just trying to, if you have a chemical library, you are trying to keep the top 1%, and you want that 1% you want that you want that one percent to be enriched with potential binding, so that the probability of finding actual ligands in that one percent is much higher than finding ligands at random. Protein flexibility. Well, why protein flexibility is a problem? Because when you do this screen, it has to be fast. <coughs> Be fast. The first thing that you do is you consider that your protein is rigid, that the protein is not moving. 
In fact, in many cases, you go a step forward, and not only the receptor is rigid, but it's you, you replace your system by potential energy mass. Even if you don't do that, just keep the atoms. The problem is that it's rigid. Um, and in some cases, that's a problem. In some cases, it's a big problem. In the sense that you might miss a lot of potential data. So the number of false negatives is very high due to neglecting chromium flexibility. So these papers are all about papers that we publish about how to incorporate ways to incorporate <laughs> chromium flexibility in hydrogen. <coughs> the other medium is the presence of waters. I mean, at some point, usually what you do when you're going to do it, you remove all the water from the system. <coughs> in many cases, that's the best approach, not in all cases. With some artifacts and graphic waters, some water that you have to dig them, so that's the whole discussion. Um, also, the, the waters are dynamic. I, 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 the dynamic systems are just I mean, going back and forth, and um, you might have a ligand which binds you in water to bind inside of the ligand space. With one water to bind inside, and reproducing that the gas is very different. The other problem, which is uh, also consequence of some of these, there are false positives and negatives. So there could be errors at the docking stage, errors at the scoring stage. Errors at the docking stage are not recovered, should not be recovered by the scoring stage. This is a representation of ligand RMSE versus rung. So let me explain to you how this experiment was done. I selected four chromic kinases which were about 29 X-ray structures. Each of these has a negative ligand. Uh, those ligands plus a set of decoys. Decoys mean uh, a decoy library is a library of molecules which are considered as non-binders. So when you talk a molecule of ligands and decoys, what you would expect is that ligands get the best score, decoys get the worst score. That's the idea. That doesn't happen that way. So for each ligand, we assess the RMSC compared to the rest of the structure. That's easy. You talk to ligand, you compare how the ligand is talked to the next ray structure. And the rank of each ligand, because this ligand is with our ligands and decoys. So when you score them, you get a rank. So those ligands get a rank. They should be at the top. But that not always happens. So this is a representation of um, all the ligands, not only the 29. Here we have cross-docking. What do I mean? PKA has many structures. With a different ligand. So you talk all those ligands to all those structures. So you get about 120 points here. So what would you expect if the protocol and the program were perfect? You would expect all the ligands to be very well known and to be to have a very top rank. So you could expect all the ligands here, in this area, or let's be generous, in this area. That's the idea. Suppose that somebody tells you, well, the program is not ideal. What, what would be your next wish? Your next wish would be, well, if it's not ideal, I would like compound molecules, binders, that 
more he saw that that means that, that they were not taught properly to have a bad one. I don't want this, my protocol to score well readers that are in place in the final side. So you say, well, if everything is, is not here, I want the rest of the points to be here. So that means you dock the molecule, you miss dock the molecule, you get the back score. That's the idea, the second stage of ideality. This is the worst. These are molecules that are completely stored, but you get a very good score. You don't like that. Why? Because then it's not going to be transferred. You will get a lot of false positives when you do your predictive, predictive screen. And here are the molecules which are not properly, but they don't get a very good score, so they run poorly. So as you see, well, there are a lot of points here, a lot of points there, very few points here, which is good, and some points in this case, here. So that gives you the figures to give you well, an idea of the relationship between docking and scoring stage. There are two stages, there are two different stages. Well, let, let me show a, a structure-based um, problem with an example. This is uh, something that we did uh, almost, I mean, eight years ago. It is a very simple application of structure-based drug discovery to the epidermal growth factor receptor in the EFR. There are hundreds of thousands of public in EFR. EGFR is a protein uh, kinase. Um, these inhibitors are a bit competitive. Why we did this? We did this because in 2003 the crystal structure of EGFR appeared. So what we wanted to see if doing a hydrotoxin campaign, we could discover new Couples, new <laughs> so this was the first one. So, um, so the input is a, a, a known protein structure. The, the PDB code is 117. This is GFR bound to a visa, which is a known drug. Uh, the input was a set of 370k compounds, which after some filtering, you uh, arrived with the 15. What we filter when we do avoid very small molecules, very big molecules, molecules that have a huge number of free potential bonds, what's called a release rule of five. I think that there is a slide uh, later on. So, with this library and this PDB, we think of hyperbook docking, which is docking and scoring. What you think you, you get is a list of molecules and then you put a list of scores. We did post screening, inspection, I mean, uh, score cutoffs, circle filters. We wanted the molecules to, for example, to make the character form with the region of the protein kinase, which is known that most of the protein kinases make a sulfate within a huge region. Specifically, the background of the hinge region and uh, the molecule. Then we did our chemical clustering. You don't want to have your hippies uh, overrepresented molecules when you do chemical clustering. So you group molecules that look similar and you keep one representative per cluster. Then, I mean, 1,000 oh, 1, compounds. Visual inspection, yes. Visual inspection of the One by one. I, I selected 50. They were purchased and given away. Well, 
50 were selected. I think that first year there were between 20 and 30. Because when you have, you have a clinical library, and when you're going to purchase with the clinical vendor, they say, well, this is not available, this is not available. So I think that we purchased 20 or 30. Um, we got one molecule, which was an ATP competitor, competitor and uh, which has an ICP of around between 10 and 15. Um, you will see why here we have these 30 and 32 in a moment. So 39 was a pretty decent compound in terms of activity to come from a radio screening uh, campaign. But we got also other molecules that were that exhibited anti-proliferative effects itself. So 39 was one of them, one of the basic ones in terms of anti-proliferative effects. But there were other two and uh, 32 were even better. But when we tested two and 32 in a biochemical assay, it showed out that it was not binding to GFR, but it was showing as a proliferative effect itself. So likely, for example, 2 and 32 were binding to some other kinase upstream or downstream. Uh, this is the binding mode. This is one of the things I was telling you that talking provides you with a tentative binding mode. Uh, our molecule is shown in yellow carbons and in white you have IRISA, which is the co-crystallized label. You see here these uh, dots represent the hydrogen bond of the ligand with uh, a residue in the heat we can just tell you in 769. Uh, for this OCI 744 is I Well, we think this this is a uh, I mean this this, this slide is a little bit when you have a chemical library you want have molecules that have an additox profile. Additox stands for absorption, so the component is the moment common absorbed properly, distributed, metabolism, spread properly, and you want the molecule to have zero toxicity. I mean, you don't want the molecule to be very potent that kills your kind of cell, that kills every cell in the body. So you want zero toxicity. So I think of the property are related to many physical chemical properties, which basically are this. There are, you can try to predict some of these in silicon. Some are uh, determined mentally. Um, the Lipinski rule of five, Lipinski some years ago made a sort of statistic of uh, market drugs. Concluded that most of the drugs have very few violations, violations to these rules, which are <clears throat> less than five hydrogen bond donors, less than ten hydrogen bond acceptors, less than 500 or over weight, less than five of C lap P, so lap P is the partition coefficient. That's your <coughs> How is the transfer between oxygen and water? And it has less than, well, 10 torsions, free torsions, for a tickable bond. So, was it, I mean, essentially, what's the problem of having a very, very flexible molecule as a drug that the very flexible molecule in water is moving a lot because it's flexible. Once it finds, Its mobility increases a lot. It gets stuck in the binding site. 
That means that the entropy decreases because the number of accessible states increases. So that means that the binding <coughs> highest contribution to the binding free energy is quite high. Free energy and free energy is a very effective model to buy. So that's why usually you want more as rigid as possible. It's another problem. If you have a very flexible molecule, that molecule can bind many things. If you need to reach molecules, you <coughs> want to select on average, of course. Well, this is a lead optimization cycle which continues this uh, list. So suppose that you purchase your bioelectric to give a heat. Once you get a heat, you say, well, what can I do with my heat? Well, you want to optimize it. So you have some active compounds. What would you ideally do if you could? Well, you, you would co-crystallize your receptor with your best leads. That's a ubiquitous best way to So you get a crystal complex, and then you continue, I mean, you optimize your ligand based on what you see on the crystal interaction of your active molecules and the receptor. Sometimes this is not possible. In most of the cases, it's not possible. You don't have a crystallographer next door to your molecule. Could you crystallize this for me? Sure, in here. That won't probably happen. So what you can do is uh, an in silico ligand receptor complex. But what you take from the docking, or you can refine it, you can improve it certainly. You can do some long molecular dynamics to relax the system. And then you come with the model. Probably very good model. Good enough for the discovery. Once you have this, you do an in silico library design with the active compounds. So you have three active compounds. You try to design the library using those scaffolds. You, you try to attach uh, substituents and build an in silico library. Now you want you would like to use some admin of filters, right? You, you don't want you, you wouldn't want to include molecules which you know that at some point will have admin of strong. That means that that means that they will fail later on at the at the uh, certain uh, stage. So you here would like probably this library is not so big to do a more accurate binding free energy evaluation. Perhaps you could afford in this case some other of dynamics and try to come up with some something uh, more accurate. You might cluster to a selection, chemical optimization, synthesis, and by evaluation. Perhaps you started with a 10 micromolar molecule, and now you will, after one cycle, you are down to 500 nanomolar, a couple of cycles more, and you could be done. Well, I went through this yesterday. I won't show you too many details about the modeling. Um, let me tell you, this is a this was a modeling and a practice company project. So as I told you yesterday, the idea was uh, to work on uh, the melanin concentrating hormone one receptor. <coughs> we are aware of looking for <coughs> So we did the modeling. We come up with um, the structural model. The goal of this data figure modeling was uh, to develop a model with good quality enough for structural basement for screening, to predict the target interactions, and to be useful in mutagenesis experiments. We are not concerned about what the loop, if the answers, the way doing, which honestly we don't care. We don't care because it's really. The first one is because we don't care. It's not important for our product. And second, because we could not do that at that time. So why bother with things that we cannot call? Because your tools are not good enough or your computing time is not enough. Um, so again, 
The limitation was it was not intended to model with high accuracy regions far from the far side. So it's good that when you have a, a problem, you can uh, set the boundaries of your problem. So what do I want? I want to go here. I don't want to go I want I don't want to go here, so my method will be useful for this in this case and not in this case. So well this is a summary of the whole problem. So yesterday I showed you in this that with sequence alignment circle gameplay, no ligands, we generated an ensemble of ligand receptor complexes of the FCH. <laughs> So, after some involved procedures, we came up with four binding site models. So, how could these models be validated? There's no crystal structure. If you have a crystal structure, you don't do models. So, can you validate? Well, yes, you can check if the ligand which was selected the ligands here process uh, made the proper contacts with the receptor. Yes. But after that, you end up with four models. How do you, how do you choose a model? And how do you validate? So, the novelty here was that the binding site evaluation was done indirectly to small-scale vehicle screening. So, what I said is this. I have four models. Let's take the model that performs best in a small scale vehicle screen. How do I assess that? I take a library of ligands of MCH, I take the equal library, and I don't go. The, the final side showing the best performance that document so the binding site which recovers, which puts the most of the ligands at the top, I use that as a good model, which is, well, this one. This is showing the enrichment of the document. So on the x-axis, you have the screen database on the Y, you have the percentage of ligands recovered. So if you, what you want is that your model recovers most of the ligands at the very top, which is this model, the one which is here. So that model was selected and used now in a predictive vehicle screen to search for the compound. And we found six compounds below 20 micromolar among 129 compounds which were purchased, which people from Training Cloud told us was 11 times better than hydrogen speed. Is this the best way to validate? No, it's not. It's the best way to validate and it is and it is at that time. Well, we, we sort of this yesterday. This was, for example, these were the two top hits, and these are docked within the binding site. As you see, the docking provides you with a detailed interaction between the ligand and the receptor. So, for example, this interaction that you can see here between this aspartic on the screen and the charge amy, that's characteristic of these and many GPCRs. So, well, of course, you filter that when you're checking your ligands drop within the binding site, you check that. Is this solvage present? If it's not present, you discard it. That should be there. We saw also that slide uh, So to finish, <coughs> so what kind of field of use of the 
summary in what he discovered. So, well, what he did, discovered. So he is, you know, not, you know nothing, you have no legacy, you have a door from this session, and you're trying to use completion of tools to discover something, find something. So you serve within a chemical library, computational efficiency is solved. You have to have a screen and large data. So the goal is to generate a smaller chemical sublibrary and rich with potential binders. So there are many approaches here. Talking, which is the one that I focus on. Fragment-based, you know, design. You are trying to build li uh, ligands, molecules, built from fragments. So you start talking, for example, fragments. And if a fragment talks well, and another fragment <coughs> talks well, and the other fragment talks well, you have to link them, which is very nice, but you have to take care of something that you can, you could came up with the most beautiful molecule, and then you approach a chemist and say, I have this for Nice, it's impossible, I cannot do it. So, you're stuck. So, um, uh, synthetic feasibility is an issue. Um, form of a 4B screening, so <clears throat> it's another way to do several days of screening using pharmacopores. Pharmacopores, you can uh, get pharmacopores from your existing living or for your receptor and thank you much. So uh, you have a aromatic uh, interaction with the hydrogen and thank you much your being Lead discovery. So, um, well, here in fact, it's a lead optimization. So, the, the, the chemical level is smaller. Now you have a heat, you are trying to optimize, or a kind of heat, 15, 5 minutes. Not only that, you are trying to optimize that, you are trying to build a library of many compounds, but not millions. You seek a more accurate prediction of the relative binding energy. You can afford that now. So which approach do you have? For example, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is a way to sample, to explore the energy hypersurface, molecular dynamics, quantum mechanics, free energy perturbation, thermodynamic integration, different methods that are more sophisticated and take more time than just using an empirical score. For protein modeling, you can use computers. So you do Monte Carlo, molecular dynamics, and as refined panels. You also want to study structure dynamics function. So for example, simulation of few ligands in the receptor. Let me give you an example. This one receptor that can act as a uh, suppose that it can act as an agonist and antagonist. A AR under the receptor. So, glutamide um, is an antagonist to AR. But some patients develop a mutation to this, what is the killing of the 77 after which glutamide becomes an agonist. That's because the mutation is within the body inside, it's not conservative in the size of the is quite similar. So why is that happening? When you go to glutamine, find different objects. So you can study that, for example, with molecular dynamics, and try to understand why that mutation, that change in structure, is having an impact in culture. And probably is related to the dynamics. Uh, again, Monte Carlo, Morgan Dynamics, Quantum Mechanics. This is just to be, because always, always the question is how many drugs were discovered with Quantum Mechanics? Uh, not all of them, some of them, <coughs> some were, in, in some cases, structure based methods or computer aided drug methods. 
this is just an example of uh, cross sectoral phase start design. Uh, cross candidate from a pharmacopoeia-based screening. Uh, no success in the novel design. So the novel design is that you make the molecule you know, the scratch. So, in fact, computer aided drug discovery is computational chemistry in my own yes. uh, So, the, the advantage is that you get a physical insight of the system, or you could get a physical insight of the system. And it's also a to be predictive. So, uh, so which one should make it? The classical, to guide the development Oh, you have seen my acknowledgments as yesterday. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, we are in time. So that's it. Um, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them.